We're going to start off with uh, finance and revenue related questions. Uh, there have been a lot of concerns from the public concerning TriMet's finances, in particular concern around issues such as the unfunded pension obligations, the ongoing labor negotiations, the economy, and long-term demographic shifts. Coupled with the failure of the funding measure at the ballot and the pledge of future operating revenue to help fund Milwaukee Light Rail, many in the community are concerned that more service cuts will be necessary. What does TriMet's financial future picture look like over the long term? Well, let me sort of take that question apart a number of pieces. You may have to help me again as you go through some of the pieces. But for the first thing that I would note is that I think, obviously, we're all feeling and beginning to see that the economy is improving. And TriMet is an agency funded uh, to a large extent by the payroll tax is seeing some improvement in that payroll tax rate coming back into growth. I mean, that said, we know that this was an incredibly deep and steep recession, and so we expect that it will take some time for us to grow out of that. But that the good news is that revenue is starting to come back, jobs are starting to come back, and so we're looking uh, at a much more positive outcome for the next year um, than, frankly, we have any of the last three years. Um, that said, there are some, some challenges on the horizon, and you mentioned some of them. Um, first of all, I would say one that you didn't mention that we're watching really closely right now is diesel fuel costs. And that's not a small cost to TriMet, it's the state's largest diesel fuel um, user. Uh, for example, 15 cents on the price of diesel is a million dollars a year for us. Related to the, the union contract, I do want to perhaps light on that a little bit. Uh, the board last May, before I was general manager, actually adopted the policy that we're continuing to rely on as we talk to the uh, leadership of the uh, Amalgamated Transit Workers Union, um, the ATU. The first thing I'd like, I want to say is that I have the highest regard for our workforce. Um, they have an incredibly tough job. Their operators on the front line are second to none in the nation. Um, and all you need to do is be from outside Portland to come and uh, use our bus service and recognize what a quality job we're providing, good customer service our operators do in a very challenging environment. Um, Second, I'm, I want to just mention our maintenance workforce, which has been, again, above and beyond the call in terms of keeping our fleet at the ready and working well and responding to things such as the snow emergency that postponed the first time we wanted to do um, uh, this interview. So that said, high regard. But the board policy is very clear that what we need to do is make sure that our employee benefit costs rise no more than our revenues. Um, so that there is balance, if you will, between the revenue growth um, that is exhibited by the payroll tax and uh, the uh, growth in uh, the cost of employment. And that would include um, you know, the wages as well as uh, health benefits. I think there's no secret that the biggest issue is really um, health benefits in this conversation. And indeed, we have a very unsustainable health benefit plan in the ATU uh, union agreement right now. It has $5 copays. It has no deductibles. It has no employee contributions um, for health insurance. Now, obviously, that has changed as of January 1st when we implemented, for lack of a better term, a freeze, which basically said any new costs um, that occur because of health insurance would, be, would accrue to the employees. So there are now some employee costs that have been imposed as of uh, January 1. That doesn't substitute for getting to a, a longer term agreement. And so we're working really hard and trying every avenue we can to move either to negotiations with the union or um, at, at, at sort of the last uh, step in the process, an arbitration, where the third party arbitrator actually decides the case. Uh, I would love to be in that case of, of the arbitration today. Uh, I'd love to have it. Uh, passed us as soon as possible. Right now, the union leadership is continuing to um, use the procedural mechanisms available to it under what I have found to be sort of an arcane uh, employment law world here in Oregon um, that uh, allows them to delay that. So we're working really hard on that. Meanwhile, the, the uh, if you will, fees of wages and fees of cost into health insurance is helping us sustain the budget into the new year. So uh, my hope, while I can't say that there will be no service cuts, that that, that would be uh, really last thing on the, on the list right now, 
Um, and um, we're, we're going to be looking, I think, at a, a much more sustainable uh, financial future, particularly if we're successful with the union contract over a period of time. Final point that was in that question was about OPEB or other post-employment benefits, um, which is um, an interesting topic and sometimes a topic only uh, accountants can love, but it's a very important one. First of all, just to note that um, we began to calculate that number, um, which is a big number for TriMed. It's over $800 million. Um, and what it is is a projection of what the current value of all the medical benefits that would be promised retirees after employment, after uh, retirement, uh, would be. Uh, so if you try to take all those costs over the next, you know, 30 or 40 years and bring them back to a current dollar, that's what that is. One has to recognize that that number will change based on what the outcome of the union negotiations. Indeed, we've changed it dramatically already for non-union employees at TriMet by changing that plan dramatically and frankly reducing some of the benefits associated with, uh, and the cost of some of the benefits associated with medical care. TriMet's no different than anybody else in the universe right now, at least the, 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 the country, dealing with this increasing cost of medical care and medical insurance, and um, we're, we're um, like everybody else, looking for good solutions. Uh, so TriMet recently launched a dashboard feature on, on the web. Uh, has TriMet considered an annual or quarterly state of the transit presentation as a way to inform and interact with those who uh, contribute to their services? We have considered that, and actually that is something that I'd like um, to begin to add to our portfolio, if you will, of communication devices, whether it's a re report to the writers or report to the stakeholders or wh whoever you might term that, I think that we do have a good story to tell about uh, our service and what we've been accomplishing over the last uh, years. So um, yes, we'd like to see that. And um, I will just also note on the dashboard is that what you see right now, I think, is our first uh, blush attempt at to putting out some good information, some transparent data. We're going to expand that, particularly in the area of safety. We're going to put a lot more safety information out. Uh, and we're very open and amenable to changing that dashboard. For example, some people have suggested that in addition to the, just the stats, we should have some better explanations of what they are and what they mean and what the trends may mean. So we may be adding some to that as well. Is there any plan to charge a fee, even a nominal one, at park and ride lots as a source of revenue? Um, there isn't right now. Um, one of the things we're finding still is that uh, Park and Ride continues to, continues to be a relatively modest um, mode of access to the TriMet system. If you compare, for example, TriMet total Park and Ride spaces to that, for example, in Denver or some of our other peer cities, the comparison, you find that we have a pretty small number. And indeed, if you look at the green line, even though we've met uh, ridership expectations for that ride, the park and ride lots are, are still well uh, under capacity. So we don't think that we're at the point in the market, the development of the market for park and ride where we can charge. Um, and um, there are probably a couple of cases where we're beginning, both uh, Gateway and Sunset, where we're beginning to, uh, again, use meters to allow some part some um, short-term use of uh, the park and ride in addition to the, the all-day park and rider use. I think what we'll see over a period of time in the short term is just the expansion of that, um, of that function. So uh, some of our readers have a concern that the definition of frequent service has been watered down during the recent cuts. Uh, frequent hours have been cut back and some lines do not run at 15 minute or better frequencies. If service is not increased soon, is it better to retire the frequent service moniker than lowering it as a standard? Well, I think, first of all, the, the, the budget emergencies that we've been in because of this Great Recession has, has required us to lower that standard in some cases, um, mostly during midday and shoulder periods. Um, I would say that's a temporary lowering of standards. Our objective is still to re restore that back to the 15-minute uh, level of frequency that was originally defined with frequent service. Indeed, my objective would be to begin to see the frequent service brand grow and spread across the region in terms of some additional great lines uh, that I think um, deserve that level of service and would benefit by that level of service. I would just also note that we have been, over this year, been able to add some service during peak hours to some of the uh, 
crust load lines so that we are beginning to recognize that we've got some crowding problems. We're beginning to, res to respond to that. We did it on the 12, we did it on, on a couple other lines. And we believe that the budget next year will need to address that as well. So while that doesn't address that uh, midday 15-minute um, frequency issue, it does address the high-level service that we need uh, during the peak hour to address um, our growing demand. Okay, so then uh, ridership trends have been lackluster recently with buses even losing mode share. To what extent is this the economy and to what extent is this a lack of speed or frequency in the current transit service? Well, I think there's a number of factors in play. First of all, recall that we did do some fairly major changes to the system over the last year. Um, and we're beginning now to be in a point where we can measure cleanly, more cleanly, the policy changes um, from fairly square, where it became fairly square to free rail zone. And so that shifted some riders from uh, bus to rail. Uh, clearly, the green line over time shifted some riders from bus to rail. So we're serving riders still, uh, but we're doing it more on the, on the rail system. So I think that was a factor. I think the other factor is the economy, which is that uh, our ridership has traditionally and has always followed employment. And so when employment goes down, so does ridership. Uh, so that is a factor again, and again, indeed, some of the peak hour crowding we're beginning to see on the system is a, a really positive sign that the economy is beginning to rebound some. Um, so I think fundamentally, I think those are the, 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 the bigger drivers of, of the ridership change that you've seen. I would say as a big picture, we have to be pretty pleased with where ridership is. Um, we have reduced over the last uh, couple of years uh, bus service by 13 percent, yet we're seeing ridership down what, th two to three percent on a, on a regular basis. So um, we have, I think that shows we did a pretty good job of, of, of using a really sharp scalpel in terms of the service reductions that we had to use over the, now, over the last, um, last couple of years. To follow up on that, um, to improve speed, has TriMet considered removing or consolidating some of the downtown MAC stations? You know, we have at various points in time looked at that. Um, we haven't launched any really serious community conversation about it. Um, one of the things uh, that you get to is uh, you, the general response we get is, well, you can remove stations, but don't remove my station. And if everybody says, don't remove my station, you're not removing any stations. And so I'll give you a, a quick example, which is, you know, one of the, th the stops that, you know, frankly, we look at and say, well, pretty close to, uh, if you look at Skidmore, it's pretty close to the Old Town Station, it's pretty close to the Oak Street, maybe we should, re well then the University of Oregon um, put a major investment in, to a large extent, as did Mercy Corps, to a large extent um, to respond uh, and to, to use the, the station as a sort of a, a focal point for those developments. So you begin to build in this infrastructure that makes it a little harder to change. That said, I think that there will be a point in time when we're going to want to have a broader community uh, conversation about the sort of realignment of stations along both First Avenue and Morrison Yamhill in particular. The model we do like is what's on the Portland Mall now, which is about every four blocks there's a station, which I think, um, uh, I think is providing a good service level uh, with still reasonable walk distances. Mm -hmm.